I got to do the yoga. This is four. We're just going to have to, sh there's no choice. I don't know. They're going to have to shorten it. There isn't a choice. It's, I, I have no choice. Okay, so we're going to go, um, it's going to have to, uh, if we end that at 3 o'clock and begin the next one at 3 to 4, okay, 5 after 3, does that work for you? 5 after 3, so we're going to go till 5 after 3. Um, I'm going to um, not time the speakers, but I'm going to ask the chair of each session to time the speakers, you don't have to worry about that. Okay. Uh, we are all on. Uh, uh, the next announcement at 3 o'clock, 5 after 3, there should be um, uh, uh, the pair group with Brenda Dunn will be in this room. And then also uh, at next session will end promptly at 4 and one of the most important sessions of the day begins at 4. Everyone, please be here. It's very prompt, very important, and you're going to like it. But it's very, very important. Ask if anyone has a speaker we can borrow for that. Does uh, we somehow are missing a speaker for? Does anybody have a computer speaker with them by some chance that they keep in their back pocket? Okay, um, I'll come there and we'll figure out a plan B. Okay, we're going to begin here. Uh, thank you very much. Do not forget to fill out your evaluation forms. I expect everyone to say wonderful things about me and just say whatever else you want about the others. But yeah, please fill out these evaluation forms and, 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 and it's, it's very, very important. Thank you very much. Vanya, did you have enough forms for everybody or you need more? Uh, uh, we're going to use the mic, but a little softer because there's meetings next door. Yeah. Really not loud, so I, I don't know what will happen to the mic. Yeah, there's a, another breakout session going on. So I'm going to ask everyone to move forward who wants to participate in, in this session. So we're going to reduce the volume a little bit here. In, in this session, we're going to look how the concept of a consciousness-based universe influences scientific presentations related to the Vedic cosmology in different fields such as archaeology and biology. And I'm going to be presenting first and then after me will stand my approach. You have to appreciate that I'm a, I regard myself or I present myself in those circles as a transcultural person. Mm. I was born in the West, but I became the disciple of a guru from India and uh, became part of another knowledge tradition. Mm. And as part of that consciousness of my identity, I've taken guidance from the Puranas, which are the Vedic historical writings and cosmological text. And they give an account of what I call extreme human antiquity, uh, the idea that humans like us have been present on Earth for vast periods of time. 
the Vedic literatures in general are full of references to such persons. <clears throat> of course, this is somewhat different from the modern consensus in modern science on human origins and antiquity, which would say that the first humans like us appeared on Earth less than 200,000 years ago. So you may ask yourself, given that perspective, how am I able to walk into a meeting of the European Association of Archaeologists and get a hearing <coughs> evidence? What I can do is make a prediction. If the Puranic accounts of extreme human antiquity are true, there should be reports of archaeological evidence for humans existing millions of years ago. And the methodology for testing that prediction in terms of the history of archaeology is to look at all the archaeological reports from the time of Darwin up to the present, let's say. And when that's done, we find there are many reports of archaeological evidence for extreme human antiquity in the scientific literature, past and present. <coughs> and uh, Richard Thompson, Sadabudavu, and I collected hundreds of such reports in this book, Forbidden Archaeology. And I'll just give a, an example or two. In the 19th century, gold was discovered in California. Miners went there to get it. They dug tunnels into the sides of mountains like Table Mountain in the Sierra Nevada Mountains. And in those tunnels, the miners found human bones and human artifacts and layers of rock that modern geologists tell us belong to the early part of the geological period called the Eocene, which would mean if these things are not intrusive, they would be about 50 million years old. These discoveries were reported to the scientific world by Dr. J.D. Whitney, the chief government geologist of California. He published these reports in his work, The Auriferous Gravels of the Sierra Nevada of California, published by Harvard University in the year 18. Geologists reported finding a finger bone, small thing, but it, there's an important lesson to be learned here. Uh, they found a finger bone at uh, Olduvai Gorge in Tanzania in layers of rock 1,840,000 years old. It's from Nature Communications. <coughs> this is the bone. Technically, it's called the left fifth proximal manual phalanx, and it was designated OH86. That's the specimen number. <coughs> The archaeologists carefully studied the bone. They measured it, and they compared the measurements to the same finger bone and different species of apes, monkeys, different kinds of hominins like Australopithecus and Homo erectus. They also compared it to anatomically modern human <laughs> finger bones. They found it fit squarely in the human group and not in the ape and monkey and hominin groups. Now, <clears throat> here's what they said in their report. OH86 represents a hominin species whose closest form affinities are to modern Homo sapiens. However, the geological age of OH86 obviously precludes its assignment to Homo sapiens. <clears throat> It's just a, a, a modern example of how one's consciousness can influence how one evaluates different categories of evidence that come to one's attention. <clears throat> My conclusion would be there's no reason to suppose 
why we couldn't say OH86 should be assigned to Homo sapiens and be given an age of 1,840,000 years. So the significance is this evidence is consistent with the accounts of extreme human antiquity found in the Puranas. Um, and again, you know, some people will object to bringing in something from a, a Vedic source or a biblical source or any other type of spiritual source into a such a short time. Abram Lincoln once wrote a letter to a friend. He wrote, I'm writing you a long letter. I don't have time to write you a short one. Uh, so that's kind of the challenge. Um, I've written a short paper that my wife will just pass out a copy to each of you. So if I miss something, don't have time. At least you can study it for yourself afterwards. Anyhow, um, I've made this presentation called Intelligent Design or uh, symptoms of the action of consciousness in a modern Vedic context. We're talking about consciousness, and uh, but consciousness is something that's very hard to actually study, except our own immediate conscious experience. We can only study consciousness circumstantially or indirectly. One such category of studies of symptoms of consciousness uh, is symptoms found on physical objects, physical events. And this kind of studies can be called for, uh, for argument from design. In, uh, in uh, American 1847, where must we look for this fountain but to the great storehouse Oops. of nature? The innumerable and divers diversified objects there were presented to our view give evidence of infinite skill and intelligent design in the adaptation to each other and to the nature of man. The Oxford scholar F.C.S. Schiller wrote in 1897, it will not be possible to rule out the supposition that the process of evolution may be guided by an intelligent design from 1897. Even Alfred R Russell Wallace, the co-developer of the Charles Darwin of a theory of evolution, came to believe that a higher intelligence guided the process. Then if we turn to uh, the Vedic tradition of India, um, which is arguably older and richer than the Western tradition, also their design arguments are commonplace. For instance, Shankara wrote around 800, in the case of such things as a lump of earth or stone, no power of contrivance is seen but the design of special forms out of such things as clay is seen when they are superintended by potters and the like. In the same way, material nature transforms itself only when connected with a superintendent external intelligence. The philosopher Diana, around 900, wrote, whatever possesses a cause like a chariot is dependent upon a prior intelligent causal agent. Similar in character is this world. Therefore, it is dependent upon a prior intelligent causal agent. Also, Ramanuja was discussing design arguments, although uh, to a large degree, degree criticizing them for their limitations. Some have even drawn a parallel to Hume's later criticism of design arguments. Ramanuja stated that one cannot conclude the designer is God, who is omnipotent, benevolent, etc. There may be many designers, or maybe they are limited, imperfect, or not even transcendental. But Ramanuja still did see that design arguments have their place to counter materialistic ideas. Thus, he argued against the atheistic Sankhya philosophers as follows. The pradhan, or nature, that you Sankhyas affirm is not competent to produce the arrangement of this variegated world, for it is non-intelligent and not superintended by an agent understanding its essential nature. So it is in similar situations, just as wood and other materials by themselves are incompetent to construct a chariot or palace. Not the case. The statement creationism disguised as science is a totally false view of what has happened. Let's see what science can tell us. That's what intelligent design is about. Uh, also, if ID, intelligent design, had religious how could the famous English, until then atheist, Anthony Flew, have changed his mind and become convinced by 
intelligent design that, quote, the findings of more than 50 years of DNA research have provided materials for a new and enormously powerful arrangement, powerful argument to design. Nothing critics can say, whether appealing to politically motivated condemnations of ID issued by pro-Darwin scientific authorities or harping upon the religious beliefs of ID proponents will change the fact that intelligent design is not a faith-based argument. The chemist, Dr. Charles Thaxon, who became an early advocate of intelligent design, said, the idea of that life had an intelligent source is hardly unique to Christian fundamentalism. Advocates of design have included not only Christians and other religious theists, but pantheists, Greek and Enlightenment philosophers, and now include many modern scientists who describe themselves as religiously agnostic. Moreover, the concept of design implies absolutely nothing about beliefs normally associated with Christian fundamentalism, such as a young earth, a global flood, or even the existence of the Christian God. All it implies is that life had an intelligent source. The term intelligent design was coined in its present usage by the British cosmologist, Dr. Sir Fred Hoyle. In 1982, he stated, if one proceeds directly and straightforwardly in this manner, without being affected by a fear of incurring the wrath of scientific opinion, one arrives at the conclusion that by materials with the of order must be the outcome of intelligent design. In a book named By Design, Journalist Larry Whitham traces the roots of the intelligent design movement in biology back to the 1950s and 60s and the movement itself to the 1970s. Biochemists were unraveling the secret of DNA and discovering an elaborate information processing system that included nanotechnology of unparalleled sophistication. One of the first to describe the significance of these discoveries was chemist and philosophy Dr. Michael Polanyi, who in 1966 argued that machine are irre irreducible to physics and chemistry, and that mechanistic structures of living beings appear to be likewise irreducible. Polanyi also wrote, information in the DNA can no more be reduced to chemistry than the ideas in the book can be reduced to ink and paper, something beyond physics, and chemistry is encoded in the DNA. Biochemist chemist Michael Behe would later develop Polanyi's insights with his irreducible complexity. And mathematician William Dembski would find Polanyi's work so influential that he set out to develop a mathematical <laughs> criterion to be able to infer intelligent design with certainty, which ended with his specified complexity. Thus today, the design argument is back with a renewed force, partly due to the scientific evidence of molecular biology, partly due to theoretical advances by design theories. Dembski thus argues that his statistical criteria of specified complexity or specified small probability is a sure indicator of intelligent design. He argues that if an event exhibits both a very small probability and at the same time corresponds to an independently given pattern, a specification, one can with certainty infer design. Previously, design arguments were analogies where one feature known to be designed and another feature of unknown origin were compared and similarities were used to argue for the design of the latter. This argument was mainly intuitive for the question is, what does actually constitute sufficient similarity? Two objects may have similarities but also show some differences, otherwise they would be identical objects. So how does one decide the phenomena of inspiration and instincts and behaviors in animals defying simple natural explanations? Thus, the modern Vedic inspired design arguments carry in some ways unique approach, while at the same time drawing fully on all the insights of the broader ID movement. I think that was it. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Leif Jensen, Lolita Navdas. And now I invite Isvan Tassi. Oh, we need our computer. Uh, 
our time has been shortened and people have things to say. If, if they finish early, we can. There was a question of cutting off the presentations or So Isvan Tassi is for Krishna Das, has a PhD in history of science from the ELTA, the main science university in Budapest, Hungary. He'll be speaking to us about instincts as a mystery in science. Mr. Chairman, ladies and gentlemen, it's a great pleasure and honor to be here and speak about animal instincts as one of the mysteries of uh, science. The outline of my presentation, first, I will be show you how modern science, ethology, uh, explain the uh, instinctive behavior of animals. Then I will give an example from the animal kingdom, which is show the mis shows the mystery, and I will mention the related unanswered questions. And finally, I will uh, approach the topic from Vedic or Vaishnava point of view, how mm, Vaishnava scholars, philosophers can see uh, animal instincts, which is uh, quite different than how modern science uh, sees it. Basically, two types of animal behaviors in the living world. One is uh, learned. During the lifetime of an animal, and the second type is inherited. So they born with it, like a spider, from the beginning know how to uh, make it's net and different spider species make different types of nets so they have this kind of knowledge from their birth without any learning process. For us at the moment these uh, inherited instincts are the more interesting. Uh, if we count instincts in general there are different types of uh, instinctive behaviors related to feeding of animals, defense, use of language, migration, navigation, reproduction, instinctive behavior. Are there, there are complex, uh, complex behavioral programs with many elements. Where are the instincts? It's also uh, an unanswered or partially unanswered questions, but according to modern science, in a general sense, the instincts, the code of these instincts are somewhere in the genes, somewhere in the chromosomes, and the genes code a specific network in the brain, and when this specific network uh, is activated, then these uh, instinctive behavior uh, appear on the surface. So the place of the uh, instinct is one question, that, but, but the biggest question uh, is the origin of instinctive programs. How these uh, programs and sometimes very complex softwares in the ani uh, animal mind uh, was originated. And basically, theoretically, or from philosophical point of view, we can give two types of answer to this question. One is by unguided ev evolution, and it is the majority uh, approach nowadays in scientific circles. But in theory, from philosophical point of view, we also can say there is another option, 
these programs ap appeared uh, or originated in the animal mind by a higher will, or we use the analogy of uh, computer programs, by a higher programmer. And um, modern science, when they speak about, uh, honestly, about animal instincts, the origin of this complex program, uh, they, <coughs> they honestly tell us that they have no clue, they have no uh, proven answer for this. May I quote uh, Gordon R. Taylor, who was earlier the chief science advisor for BBC television. He wrote one of his books. When we ask ourselves how an instinctive pattern of behavior arose in the first place and become hereditarily fixed, we are given no answer. So actually, actually they, uh, they cannot figure out how these uh, instinctive behaviors are coded in the GNA because according to modern science or one law uh, of the biology, learned behavior isn't uh, go into the DNA. So how, how, how they are planted into the DNA, they, they, are, they have no answer. Another problem related to this, which makes a problem more uh, complex, the complexity itself, the complexity of instincts, because instinctive behavior is often composed by many cooperative elements. As I mentioned, there are long programs, long software some, in some cases, and all the elements are necessary for a useful action. Without a complex program, it's a broken program and, and it's not useful. There is no use for survival. So we can ask the question, how could such behavior chains, ethologists use this expression, behavior chains, related elements of uh, instinctive behavior, develop step by step? Because according to modern biology, every feature and ability of animals appeared by step by step long processes. So let's mm, see the example of the Pacific golden plover, which is a relatively small bird and famous because of, his, of its uh, migration pattern. The bird in half uh, of a year um, lives in Alaska and in springtime it migrates, or so the population um, migrate to Hawaii and in autumn time they come back. That means uh, 2200 miles above the open ocean and an interesting point that fledglings follow their parents few, week, few weeks later. So first the old birds migrate to Hawaii and then the newborn uh, fledglings uh, follow them, but it's a real mystery. How do they know? They never learned, learned it, never saw it, they have no experience, but they can find the way uh, to, which helps them if even on the way there is some headwind, then they even can uh, reach Hawaii. So it's a really exciting. Uh, and here are a few uh, unanswered related questions to this uh, migration behavior. How do the young birds know the direction and the destination? They are just there in Hawaii, in, in Alaska. They know nothing about Hawaii. How do they know? We have to go, we have to do this direction and there after 2,000 uh, 200 miles, there will be some island, we are sure. It's, it's a mystery. How do they know the amount of fat energy needed? And as I mentioned, it, it can be precise. Not too long, not too less, just enough. And how do they know when to leave is the time. Well, now we have to go. And now it's the time to come back. So, and the final question related to the origin, is a step-by-step -step scenario possible for the origin of this or this type of instincts? 
And it's hard to imagine a step-by-step -step scenario because here is Hawaii, here is Alaska. So if we try to think in an evolutionary way, then we can say, oh yes, first, in earlier times, one generation of birds went only to 100 miles, and then they all died in the middle of the ocean. And then the next generation went 1,500 miles, and then they died in the ocean. But there is a problem with this explanation. If, it, if they all died, the whole population died, then how can we speak about the next generation? So there is, there is no step-by-step -step explanation in principle. So all elements of the migratory behavior had to be present at the same time. The whole software can be done. Otherwise, there is no useful migration and they cannot survive. So successful migration is the result of matching anatomical and mental elements. And at least the key elements of this instinctive behavior has to be there for the useful action, for the useful migration. So the mental software, if the step-by-step -step process cannot work, then can be reasonably attributed to the programming activity of a higher intelligence. This is the basic argument of our book, Nature's IQ, which contains more than 100 similar examples to this. But finally, I would like to speak about a little from uh, Vaishnava perspective. Uh, Vaishnava is one of the main branches of Hinduism, and Vedanta is the summary conclusion of the Vedic literature. So according to this um, Vedanta philosophy, living entities are non-material, eternal spark of consciousness. And these non-material sparks are living in biological bodies, plant bodies, animal bodies, or human bodies. This is a simple model of, uh, of a living being. There is the conscious soul who is itself the living being. And around it, there is a subtle body, which is the space of the mind, intelligence, and ego, and any other uh, cognitive activities. And in this case, we can say the instincts are also coded in this area. And there is the biological, physical body, what we can see and uh, touch. So the manifested living entities according to Vedanta, are controlled by behavioral programs in their minds. So the mind filters the consciousness of these animals and force them to, to behave in a certain way. So animals have different types of bodies. The elephant, the flamingo, and the tiger is different by body, but they are also different by their softwares and we can say they have a body plan and they have a matching uh, software in their mind. Finally, I would like to quote uh, Srila Prabhupada, who is a famous teacher, most famous teacher of Vaishnava philosophy in modern time. Once he said, the construction of dwelling place, it is known even to the birds and the beasts. The mouse also knows how to live within the earth. They make a hole according to their capacity. The birds also. They make their nest also to live comfortably. Ants also. So this intelligence is there. God has given that intelligence. So as he formulated, instincts can be seen as one type of intelligence uh, given by God uh, and forcing the animals uh, behave in a certain way. So according to the Vaishnava outlook on life, the specific animal instinct software originates from the supreme, most intelligent person. In conclusion, certain behaviors are hardly explainable by the mutation and selection process. Therefore, we should consider the possibility of a higher intelligence in the background. Thank you very much for your kind attention.
so I told the speakers that if they finished, they had 20 minutes each. If they finished early, they can take questions. So Ishvara Krishna finished five minutes early, so he's entitled to take questions. Are you there? Where did you go? All right, so he's, since you asked first, okay. We will figure out later. Yes. Yes, yes, we, we go deeply into the, we went deeply into the literature of ethology when we wrote our book and personally uh, consult with ethologists in, in their department and show the example, can you ex explain it? No, not at the moment, they say. They have the faith, somehow or other they will able to explain it, but honestly, uh, told us they cannot cannot do it at the moment. Other questions for any of the speakers? Go ahead. Oh, I did mention that my she was asking if I would mention that there's a special offer for my book, My Science, My Religion. What is the special offer? Oh. Hmm. Uh, I have to think about that question. Sorry, I think. Okay, I want to thank you all for coming to hear this session. Thank you for your questions and your attention. Thank you.